standard ottoman hook blade. There's two parts. What's up, everybody? I'm the hook. And I'm the blade. And I'm that, like, hidden blade dagger thingy that Connor has where, like, you shoot it out and then he, like, flips it around and grabs it and it's, like, really not ergonomic at all and totally gonna stab himself in the hand. That's me. Hi, I'm Blue from Overly Sarcastic Productions. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Hook Blade Podcast, a show about all things Assassin's Creed. I'm your host, Lawson. With me, as always, is my co-host, Tim. And joining us this week, he, he's a modern day philosopher, a historian, a gentleman sword fighter, <laughs> an all around Renaissance man. And once upon a time, he was voted Assassin's Creed fan community's sexiest man two years running. <laughs> oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, this is great. It feels like I'm, I'm coming home back to my old AC podcasting days. This is great. Yeah. Yeah, today you know him as Blue from Overly Sarcastic Productions, a YouTube channel that covers literature, mythology, and history with sarcastic but highly informative flair. Um, but before that, we were collaborators on a handful of like Assassin's Creed fan community projects, including a podcast roughly, uh, you know, half a decade ago. So hopefully this is uh, pretty nostalgic. Holy hell. Wow, that's... Oh, when you put it like that, that makes me feel, uh, wow, I just like time skipped in real life. Jeez. Yeah, dude. But let's see, we had Animus Island. We had yeah. uh, the Bureau until sophomore year kicked me in the teeth. And I'm like, I, <laughs> yikes, I can't do this. Um, and then we had um, Legacies, the story which was like, yeah, it's like an old Assassin's Creed fanfic story, but like was kind of better than it had any right to be. I still stand by Maybe that. It was. I was like, no, we made good choices there. Like that was good. I, I like that. Yeah, if you guys do some careful Googling, you may indeed find a a fan fiction that uh, <laughs> Blue and I wrote together when I was a sophomore in high school about uh, Shay, Connor, and Arno crossing paths. Because all these dummies are alive at the same time. Ubisoft was was wasteful exactly. to not put them in a room together. And I was around to read them every week or every however often you put them out. <laughs> Weeks, months, eh, it all blends together. <laughs> However long it took. Um, yeah. yeah, we worked on a lot of fun stuff. And obviously, Tim and I are really uh, glad to have you with us this week because we are talking about we're, we're just going to we're going to pick your brain and use your expertise here to talk about historical accuracy across the whole Assassin's Creed franchise, what it means, what it you know, what it accomplishes in each game, how it relates to the gameplay, the story. Is it good to be historically accurate? How historically accurate should the games be? All these questions and more. Um, I should probably say right up top that we're not talking about the the historical accuracy that people are talking about when they're like, but, 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 but I can't be a woman Viking. He couldn't be gay. Like, that's not what we're doing at all. Pretty much all that stuff is legit. Yeah, no, I mean, it is. We there, there are weird like Norse rules about like women can't go to Valhalla, but like there were women Vikings. Like it's a thing. Yeah. There are a lot of like, oh, well, women can't be in a video game having any agency because it doesn't align with my <laughs> narrow, uh, my very narrow view of how history works. Like, no, that's. Stop lying. That's it's not true. There are many things that Ubisoft has been kind of screwy with, especially as we've learned this year with like women in their games. But like Oof. being a woman Viking, yeah. like totally, totally a thing. Not as common. Yeah. But like, you know, no one really would have batted an eye. So, yeah, we're, we're not, we're not going to do that nonsense. We're going to talk about like history stuff, like interesting things that we can have discussions about and not just like get into one sided flame wars with uh, straw and arguments of very obscure themes of like sexism and yeah exactly yeah, people on the internet are dumb sometimes <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah so kind of as a jumping off point um for a start we do highly recommend you check out and we will link these uh in the description of the episode here um blue did a couple of videos called realism review both talking in depth like 15 minutes a piece about the historical accuracy in origins and odyssey like i was watching the uh i was re-watching the odyssey one the other day and it always like blows my mind that like Sparta did not have a navy. <laughs> Didn't have boats. They they could not sail. It's <laughs> it's it's the funniest thing. Because like the, the game has such like an emphasis on like, oh, there are these land battles between Athens and Sparta and these naval battles between Athens and Sparta. Like, no. 
No, there weren't. They're pretty like, much Athens, all made up. <laughs> Athens couldn't field an army that could take on Spartan hoplites, and Sparta like barely knew how merchant ships worked. They they couldn't take on Athenian triremes. So what makes the Peloponnesian War so complicated and interesting is because it was an asymmetrical fight. And the game, like for all of the things they get right, which we'll get into very shortly, like one of the most like off-putting like aspects of of odyssey from like a gameplay perspective is the idea that like it was an equal war like it, it wasn't <laughs> they, they couldn't even meet each other on the field of battle because they knew they would get blown out of the water wow it's it's the wildest thing to see like yeah i can go into a spartan uh navy and go beat up these athenian ships no it's impossible <laughs> and that's one of those things that you know like you were saying in the video it makes perfect sense Mm -hmm. gameplay wise why oh we yeah. want to have battles happen we want the player to be able to fight in a war that's happening and you know if there was no uh, other accurate easy way to do that you can kind of see why they would have cut those corners yeah it's concessions that you just need to make to be able to have a game at the end of the day let me ask you this mm -hmm. what's a really good example if you have one of a time that the games were historically inaccurate and either it, it was a missed opportunity, like being accurate would have been better for the game or mm -hmm. that you feel like they might have just straight up gotten something wrong. Hmm. Maybe that's too broad a question. That's but, uh, um, well, I'll, I'll keep that in the back of my mind. It's it's hard to think of like, OK, we got like 18 mainline Assassin's Creed games and yeah. you know, four of the time periods I kind of know about, like six of them <laughs> I'm a little bit uh, more fuzzy on. Well, let's start there then. What are the time periods that you feel really like qualified to go in depth on? That is very fair. Uh, th that's a good question. Basically, um, my experience with with history kind of starts with my experience with Assassin's Creed, uh, you know, playing the right. first one. I was like, OK, this, this is a cool game. And then playing AC2, I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And then playing AC Brotherhood is like, oh, whoa, holy crap, dude. So um, yeah. my like awakening to, oh, history is actually kind of a cool thing. This is new, <laughs> was really with that like Renaissance Italian setting. Um, and I ended up taking a, a trip with my dad to uh, Rome, Florence and Venice, like very shortly after playing Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. And I'm like, holy crap, so I know cool. where these places are. Um, medieval Renaissance Italy is one of the things that I really like to get into. And on my YouTube channel, um, one of the, the big memes is that, oh, blue likes venice ha 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 it's like yes yes i do like venice it's it's cool <laughs> damn it what's there not to like uh in addition to that uh my my other main area of of expertise if we can call it that is the classical world so greece um rome uh late like hellenistic egypt conveniently the setting of assassin's creed origins which makes my life a lot yeah. easier um and that kind of stuff so mediterranean classic ancient and you know mediterranean uh medieval uh, into early modern um miss me with like late british history and all the kings and queens and Holy Roman emperors with Germany and you know, <laughs> subdivided into infinity. Like, I, I can't do that stuff. But uh, the classical Mediterranean world is really my jam. So it makes my life quite convenient that a lot of the Assassin's Creed games happen to take place in this little area. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, we can definitely accuse AC of having a bit of a Europe bias. Yeah. And even when they're not in Europe, it's still Europeans who are doing everything. So it's like, ah, yes, well, this game takes place in the Caribbean and you play as a white guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, um, so those are the areas that I, I would really say that I know best. So um, conveniently, that gives me a good point of comparison because we have, you know, the old Ezio trilogy games and to a lesser extent, AC1. Um, and then we have, you know, the the newer games, the the mythical trilogy, so to speak, with with Origins, uh, Odyssey and then Valhalla, which, oh boy, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> so those are really the two areas that I would say I'm, I'm most comfortable with uh, with the history of because I, I have an a undergraduate degree in classics, which is like, hey, ancient Greece and Rome. Learn about this for four years. And like, yes, I want to <laughs> give it to me. Here's like a really kind of um, maybe it may be too broad a question, but. Out of all the games, right, mm -hmm. if you had to say with your knowledge which game, like, nails historical accuracy to the highest degree or, or the, mm -hmm. does it the best? Yeah, I, I have to recognize my own biases here, but I would right. handily give it to Assassin's Creed 2 for several different reasons. First off, the world is expertly done and it, honestly it, it always is even in the games where i feel like they're a little bit weaker in the historical accuracy departments like odyssey origins and as we'll get to valhalla the world is is always top notch ubisoft hires like some of the best people to make those open world playgrounds that you can explore because 
the setting, the people, architecture, the just the world that you can inhabit is so deliberately true to life. You know, in Grand Theft Auto, it's like, ah, oh, yes, we're in Los Angeles, but it's really Los Santos, <laughs> so we rearranged a bunch of stuff. In Assassin's Creed, it's like, no, you are in Athens. Everything is in the right spot. Like, you can <laughs> play this game and then go to the city and know where you are. And actually, that's a, that's a funny thing is that... Um, going back to AC2, which is the point of this question, was that one time I was in Florence on a, a, a school, um, like, summer study abroad trip, and I was up with my friends at the top of the, the Campanile by the Duomo, the big bell tower, and I was like, okay, I need to go meet my friends at this place, the market where you first meet La Volpe, the Mercato Vecchio, that bull statue thingy. It wasn't in the game because it came later, but this, this, like, landmark from the game, I'm like, okay, in the game, it's over here, so I was at the top of the tower, sinking at an IRL viewpoint. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. No, I see it. It's right over there. So I, I go down. I go like four blocks that way and kind of hop over a little bit to the left. And then I made my way there. And it's like, holy wow. crap, if I can do that with game knowledge, clearly the people who made this game world knew what they were doing. So just from a world design standpoint, uh, the worlds in Assassin's Creed are, have always been fantastic. Yeah. The cities were so small that you really got the chance to familiarize yourself with them yeah. and exist as a person who, you know, would have lived in these cities. So just the sense of familiarity that you get is incredible. It all starts with that. All the Assassin's Creed games, no matter how good or bad the rest of it, the worlds are always top notch and Ubisoft should be proud of how good of a job they're able to consistently do. Um, but the second thing that really makes AC2 so great is the depth of the characters. A lot of them are made up. Um, La Volpe, not a real guy. Machiavelli, completely made up. <laughs> Rodrigo Borgia, completely made up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the characters of, of, you know, your best friend is Leonardo and he makes your weapons. Like, oh my God, perfect. Um, <laughs> and, and with Machiavelli and, and a lot of the bad guys who, you know, are, you know, real ass people most of the time. Uh, yeah. Vieri is, is a made up character, but Jacopo and Francesco de Pazzi, they're real dudes. And the conspiracy that they that they did against the Medici was a real event. And what actually blew my mind was um, last year I was reading a book about Machiavelli called Be Like the Fox. It's kind of partially a biography about him, but also a book that talks about like his Florence and what it was like at that time, which is conveniently the AC2 setting. So what really like blew my mind was reading that book and getting to some parts of the historical sources for the Patsy conspiracy. The dialogue that you hear in the game is lifted right out of the original sources, like verbatim wow. quotes. A lot of the, the, the stuff um, with organizing of the conspiracy and, oh, they were going to, you know, kill them earlier, but they had to delay it to do it right in the middle of high mass. And, oh, we'll need to be on hand to make sure Giuliano gets out of bed for church tomorrow. Like, I think that one's a made up quote, but the whole thing of like, that's true to Giuliano's character. He was a lazy fuck. He didn't like to do stuff. So, you know, they really, in ways that if you were a casual player, you would never even bat an eye at. There are things that are so deeply true to how the story unfolded that like you can play the game and get an honestly pretty serviceable understanding of the the real renaissance history of the world and then there's stuff like how you know Ezio is a you know very much a playboy the opening of the game is very you know like gangs of new york like there were groups of kids who ran around throwing stones at each other it's a documented <laughs> problem in rome in the 1510s like these are all real things um so there's so much stuff that just seems like directly lifted from the sources and i can't speak to the rest of the games with that level of, of, of detail because I just I haven't studied it as much so I don't really know but AC2 is so remarkable because every time I learn more I'm like holy crap they put that in AC2 I didn't even think about that but then you know here it is so oh we are being joined by my adorable cat Cleo she is currently rubbing up against the microphone hey Cleo um, hello Cleo say hi to my friends no, she just wants to nap. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but anyway, yeah, to answer your question in way too long of a form than you asked for, uh, <laughs> AC2, good. No worries. You know, what's funny is like just yesterday, I had maybe one of the first times, one of the first times that I was learning something about history and I went, wait a second, I played that. Yeah. I'm in a political philosophy class right now and it's like week one and what they're starting with is we're looking at people who wrote about plagues. And mm. one of the first things we have to read is Thucydides talking about the plague yeah. in Athens. And I'm getting to like part of the the writing and I'm, I wasn't even thinking about it before. And then it talks about how like Pericles died of the plague. And I was like, wait, I was there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I saw I that I mean, you shit. know, the joke line in Assassin's Creed is like, oh, I've climbed that. But, you know, really yeah. it is also, oh, hey, I played that. 
And yeah. it's it's a testament to the quality of the games overall, even though some are better than others, that there's just so much history that you'll learn, like, as actually doing history and be like, oh, oh, yeah, no, I know that from AC. Like, I've seen that before. Totally. I've always liked that even though I have never really been a particularly, like, historically fascinated person, like, I, I you know, I just, I, I'm, I really hate doing research is my thing. That's my biggest problem. Oh, yeah, it's boring sometimes. But... You know, having a frame of reference from, say, playing like Black Flag, that mm -hmm. when I, you know, walk into the living room and my family's watching, uh, you know, Black Sails or whatever the show is mm -hmm. called. And I'm like, wait a second. Oh, that's, you know, that's Ben Hornigold. I know that guy. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And AC4 is a great example of of really going all in on the characters because all of those people are, are real pirates because there's such a yeah. wealth of amazing characters to draw from. Um, so, you know, props to uh, our Lord and Savior, uh, Darby McDevitt, to, to doing such a great job on, on nailing the characters uh, in that game, especially in a way that the other games... Um, even when they have real characters like AC3, who all come across as uh, kind of oh. stuffy and boring. They're um, so boring. Why are they all know, so boring in that game? You know, and that's one of the funny things is that there's sometimes like, you know, controversies that surround the games before they come out. I mean, every Assassin's Creed game has its own controversy. Like, remember when AC3 was in the hype cycle before it came out and yeah. all of the material was was uh, Radon Haketo and Connor killing red coats and it's like oh my god this game is so anti-british and like so much of the discourse like i remember on the subreddit was like this game is so anti-british and then the actual game came out and it's like oh that was that was all marketing material this is actually fine it actually paints a surprisingly balanced picture of the revolution and yeah. the anti-british propaganda is so far down on the list of concerns for this game because there's so much other nonsense that's busted that i don't <laughs> even register it <laughs> When you were saying, Blue, about how like AC2 did even more than AC1 and Granite in reality, I think there is this intricate balance that the games nail in terms of like, it's historically accurate, but it's not like Leonardo is actually like fighting battles with you. He plays a capacity in the game that makes sense for that. Like you could be reading a Leonardo da Vinci book and probably be like, oh yeah, I, I imagine he made some weapons for Ezio. Mm -hmm. Also, like when it comes to kind of the extravagant things like fighting the Pope, like it's not like you're fighting the Pope <laughs> in broad daylight or anything. You're doing it in like a super secret, you know, uh, like, you know, tomb. So I think, yeah, I think it strikes the balance of like, it's obviously like this probably didn't happen, but it, it allows you to kind of think like, oh, well, maybe this could have happened. Like my suspension of disbelief isn't being taxed. But when it comes to AC3 and <laughs> they have you take part in so many like historical, mm -hmm. historically relevant things, things that are pretty well known to people nowadays, like most people have a general understanding of the American Revolution. Yeah, mm -hmm. at least most Americans. Oh, yeah. Us as Americans. So when Connor is, you know, Forrest Gumping his way through all of this stuff, <laughs> it, it kind of sets off that alarm of like, wait a second, that's that's kind of a little silly. But when yeah, yeah, when you do it in a way like AC2, where your characters play with the play with the assassins and Ezio in a realistic capacity, like Machiavelli isn't running around like doing crazy parkour stunts and whatnot, you know, like he, he plays a realistic capacity of his historical counterpart, yeah. I think. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think AC3 is a little bit of a preview of the, the historical problems that the the mythic AC games. I don't know. Does anyone else call it that or did I just invent that? The the newer three <laughs> AC games um, run into where the original fantasy of Assassin's Creed is you're a blade in a crowd. You are operating in the shadows. No one even knows that you were there, except maybe they'll see a guy in a white hood walking away from the carnage. Whereas AC3 is like, no, you're in the, the front thing. You're, you're shooting the first shot at Lexington. You're the right. first guy to sign the Declaration of Independence. And it's just like, it, it puts you front and center in all of these things were like AC2, you know, Ezio is in a lot of really important and consequential things in Renaissance history for this period of time, but you're not front and center. You're not, you know, right in the middle of it in the way that you are with AC and that you eventually end up being with, with Origins and Odyssey and presumably Valhalla, where if you're like throwing your hood back, like, look at me, world, I'm the protagonist. Right. It ends up feeling fake because it's like, oh, well, if this character really was such a big deal, we would have known about them, wouldn't we? Um, and AC3 kind of like hides it by being like, oh, well, he's a Native American, so we're going to pretend like he wasn't there because why would we give anyone else credit? So it's like, <laughs> I, I get it. They find a way to do it narratively. But Tim, you're absolutely right that like one of the big problems of AC3 is that it puts you so far in the front to make you feel like such a cool and awesome protagonist for being in all these places that it ends up just feeling kind of hokey. 
Right. Because it seems improbable that you can be like the finger on the scales in every single turning point in the American Revolution. And that ends up breaking it by going too far. Like you have to consider too, like in that same vein of criticism, I think if you took Ezio out of AC2's events, it's not like it's it's like history shattering. If you take Connor out of AC3's mm -hmm. events, would the Boston Tea Party have even happened? Like, would, would some of these <laughs> yeah. things have even happened, you know? Like, Connor has, as you said, his, you know, his thumb on the scales to such a degree that I feel like if you took him out of the events of the story, like, the American Revolution would have been so different. And that is yeah. a big part of, like, where my uh, alarm in my head goes off. And I'm like, that doesn't seem right to me. I definitely feel like there's kind of a scale that you can imagine, a spectrum, if you will, where... On one side, you have AC3, and it's just like, okay, every person that we know of who's involved in this, you know, you get to talk to, and, and it's a little bit on the nose. And I think maybe uh, you could make a case that just to the right of AC3, like they're close to that end of the scale, but they're not quite as bad, would be, I think, Syndicate and Odyssey, just because there's so many historical characters and you're involved in so many important moments. Mm -hmm. Then you can go to the entire other end of the scale, and that's where Unity lives. And it might be the only game that lives there because there's really nothing going on that's relevant to the French Revolution. The games that end up pretty much right in the middle where you're getting a deep historical involvement and you're also not Forrest Gumping like you are in AC3. AC2 and AC4, I would say, live in that in that center. And those are mm -hmm. obviously, in my opinion, to the two best games in the franchise. Yeah. And to the point about AC4, it, it ends up working for the benefit of the story because the, the story of, of AC4 is that Edward lives in this pirate paradise and then no matter what he does, it falls apart. Yeah. So he has no ability to, Edward has no ability to stop this calamity from just, you know, crumbling down in front of him right. and stop this this huge, like, disintegration of this, this beautiful pirate paradise. So... In a way, it's like, you know, if he was there, it would still play out the same way as if he wasn't. So that ends up actually reinforcing the story um, by by somewhat taking away your agency and just letting you be there to witness the tragedy of all of these figures being laid low in their various ways. So it's like Rogue One. We all know what's going to happen, <laughs> but it's it's about like mm. the journey to get to that end point. Yeah. And what it does to the character, at least in AC4, not so much Rogue One. I know this is, this is sometimes <laughs> an unpopular opinion, but like I really liked Rogue One a lot. I like it better than a lot of other Star Wars movies, but I've got some I've got some problems with it. It's better than Solo. I mean, yeah, it's 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 not perfect. Anyway, uh, back to Assassin's <laughs> Creed. There's no historical accuracy to talk about in Rogue One. Unfortunately, no. That's what you think. <laughs> hey, they do say a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think that's a great point because like I feel like even if you do have a knowledge of like what ends up happening to these people, I feel like the story presents it in a way like they're constantly telling Edward and everyone around him who's more sensible is like this path that you're going down is going to lead you to, you know, death or what have you. And so mm -hmm. I think the story is constantly priming you for a lot of those people to, to end up dying or passing or what have you, because like Edward is on the same path as them and everyone else around him is aware of that. And I think it also is aided that like, while we do know these pirates as like kind of larger than life characters, like especially, especially Blackbeard, when you can take them and give them some humanity and some actual like character, it brings them down to reality yeah. in a way that's really compelling. Yeah. Treating the historical figures that you're going to include in the game as characters is honestly the biggest differentiator between that and something like AC3, where, you know, Samuel Adams yeah. is just there to like to deliver exposition, really. And all of those colonial dudes that you're supposed to be kicking it with, there's never any effort made to like build a friendship connection between Connor and those guys. It's always just like we could really use a guy like you to do this thing that we need to do. <laughs> ha ha ha. And they're all stuffy. And yeah, well, you know, we're, yeah. <laughs> we're going to talk a lot yeah. about the AC three problems <laughs> next week for sure. Uh, <laughs> oh, have fun with that. Uh, I, I will stay very far away, not only because it's American history, but also just, Ooh, AC three. Haven't oof. back to that one in a while. But one of the things that uh, uh, lost into your point um, on the subject of like the characters having like, character is that they do grow and change over time yeah. and one of the things about specifically a character like da vinci who is so fun in in ac2 because like oh da vinci's building your tech that's so cool he almost becomes a bit of a tragic figure in in brotherhood because he's being you know forced to work against his will in the main game and then when you yeah. when you do da vinci disappearance you just get the sense that he's being like taken for a ride by this kid salai and it's like oh no 
Da Vinci, like, what are you doing? Like, have some agency, man. Like, stand up for yourself. But, like, Da Vinci hasn't really been standing up for himself, like, kind of the entire game. He just, like, bops around between Florence and Venice and, you know, Milan and Montedigioni, just, like, doing what people ask him to do. So you can kind of see it coming, and there's this, this interesting, if tragic, arc over the course of the two games that, like, you see, like, where his, his life takes him, and it, it does kind of reflect what actually happens to him. Da Vinci was, you know, a very, like, fun and flamboyant character, but he wasn't always the happiest guy, so it's things yeah. like that that actually bring character to the game and to the characters that, you know, is missing in a lot of other types of historical media where these figures are larger than life and then they're static because they're larger than life. They're not allowed to have life. Um, it's, it's one of the things that some of the AC games do really well is, is making these people feel like people. And that's actually a, a problem that I have with... Um, uh, origins in particular, um, going back to my, my realism review on the subject beyond, you know, talking about Sparta's lack of triremes is, uh, <laughs> you know, the worlds are great, but some of the characters in those recent games really come across as kind of iffy and flat. So the yeah. two biggest personalities in origins are Cleopatra and Julius Caesar. Yeah. They are some of the most interesting people in all of ancient history because they are so charismatic, they're so abundantly smart, they are so ambitious and accomplished, but in the game, Caesar comes off as just kind of an old jock, and Cleopatra is, you know, played up as kind of slutty, where the first thing she says is, I'll sleep with anyone as long as I can kill them in the morning. Like, come on! It's, it's That's pretty... That's just yeah. embarrassing and... Well. Not only, like, not right, but, like, you had a team of historians working on this. You had a responsibility to do better because Cleopatra being, you know, turned into this, like, oh, devious, like, tricksy woman who, you know, fatale. confuses men with the power of boobs. Um, you know, that's that's a stereotype going back to the Roman period, later codified by Shakespeare, um, that is, you know, when you actually look at the, the Greek-Egyptian sources that we have, not really a thing. So right. they, they fell prey to not only an easy stereotype for Cleopatra, but even the Roman perspective of a character like Caesar is so much more than what they play him as. So, you know, two of the most interesting possible characters in all of the Assassin's Creed games are some of the worst done. And I, I don't know who did the, the script for for Origins. And, you know, granted, there's a lot of difficulty that goes into how you, you structure a game story, but oh man, that was, was a serious missed opportunity. I want to very quickly go back to when you mentioned uh, the Da Vinci Disappearance DLC, um, because there's <laughs> something I've been wanting to say about that DLC and, and, and about a, a different thing in Assassin's Creed that I have not had an opportunity for it to be relevant, but considering it involves historical accuracy, <laughs> this little tangent is going to be most relevant here. We did an episode, our second episode on the podcast was about Assassin's Creed Gold, which was an audiobook set during the Great Recoinage of like, what, 1660 something. The Great Recoinage? The hell is that? <laughs> That's one of our favorite episodes because we, we kind of trashed that whole audiobook. And I think deservedly so as far as storytelling goes. But <laughs> something I didn't realize until playing Da Vinci Disappearance is that they pretty much completely wholesale ripped off part of the Da Vinci Disappearance. Because ah. in Da Vinci Disappearance, you have Leonardo Da Vinci and you have Salai, who's his assistant. And it's sort of suggested, implied that Da Vinci and Salai have a, a homosexual romance. They, they have a little you yeah. know, thing going on. And you have that moment sort of at the end where Ezio's like, ah, he suits you. And Leonardo's like, you knew all along? And oh my gosh. And Ezio's like, it's okay. I'm, you know, uh, progressive for my time. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Leonardo. Love is love. <laughs> they do the exact same thing in gold with Isaac Newton. They're both taking characters who... I guess like historically, I think historians, there's some, there's some gray area, I think about like, they could have been gay. They could have been asexual. They could have been virgins who knows really, but some people think they might've mm -hmm. been gay or at least bisexual or yeah. what have you. And then taking them and being like, oh, here's this thing that they, you know, they have an assistant wink, wink. And then at the very end of the story, the, the main character is like, that's cool. <laughs> I just thought it was really weird <laughs> that both of these Assassin's yeah. Creed things do the exact same thing with real people, Da Vinci and Isaac Newton. It's funny when a franchise gets so bloated that it loops around and plagiarizes itself. <laughs> right. 
Anyway, that's just a quick little. Wow, that's probably the most incisive thing I've ever said about AC. (laughs) (laughs) Dude, the other day on Twitter, I said the most incisive thing I'll ever say about Assassin's Creed, which is that it is the video game equivalent of a bad sci fi channel TV show. (laughs) Which, when you think about it, doesn't that make a lot of sense? <laughs> yeah, I oh man, that's the thing. It's like there, you know, there's a lot of talk on the various online communities of like, oh, you know, old AC monolith versus new AC monolith, as yeah. if there's no variation between the two, and there aren't old AC games that suck ass and new AC games that are actually kind of good. Yeah, um, I think one of the differences between the two of them is the way in which they handle history, and we can actually kind of get into the way that the newer games handle it in this regard. Is we mentioned, or I guess I mentioned earlier, like the 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 philosophy philosophy of the older games was you are a blade in a crowd that's the fantasy you are yeah. working in the dark in the shadows behind the scenes to make all these things happen but in ac origins and in ac odyssey and presumably in ac valhalla on a kind of like over game philosophical level there's no real conflict between the assassin ideology and the templar ideology not even like just ignoring the fact that there aren't assassins and Templars. The <laughs> ideologies of order versus control is not there. Darby said he was going to bring it back for Valhalla. I am awaiting <laughs> optimistically. I, I am hopeful. But, um, you know, in addition to to that very core story difference of like what these games are about is now a different thing. It's no longer you are this in the shadows, mysterious figure with, you know, like their their hand on the scales in a way that no one would ever know. You are front and center. You are like up on the stage with everybody doing everything, you know, in the way that we we're talking about with AC3, where you are so pushed to the foreground that you're not an assassin. You're just like a generic, like everywhere hero kind of thing. Like, and that's completely antithetical to the way that the early games handled history, because the newer games give the players so much power to terraform the way that the worlds look and operate. The the character has such a unique ability to completely dictate the order of the world in a way that the earlier games had not a single trace of. Even in AC3, it wasn't that bad. And to be fair, that is, you know, that's an artifact of an open world game that responds to the player's actions. And that's, you know, whatever it wants to make nowadays is a big open world game that's dynamic and, you know, yada, yada, yada. But it, it doesn't, fit the the original idea of Assassin's Creed and it ends up feeling, you know, to what we're saying with AC3, it's kind of clunky when the main player, you know, the protagonist has way too much ability to just change the world easily, you know, without breaking a sweat. It, it just, it, it doesn't work. And in AC Odyssey specifically, it's like th- there is no character archetype that equates to what Cassandra and Alexios is doing. Like, sure, there were, there were mercenaries, but like, not really, and not until later. So for a character like Alexios or Cassandra to just be able to go between every city in Greece and be welcome, you know, like it's no big deal, is completely unheard of. Like Thucydides, the historian who is inconceivably not in Assassin's Creed, he was the Athenian general at Amphipolis where where, where the Brasidas guy uh, gets killed. He was the, the other side in that battle and he's just not a character nonsense right um but like he was able to go to sparta and like write about it and learn about it because he got exiled from athens and that's the only reason he was allowed in is he's like oh you're not with athens okay fine you know come in say hi you know take your shoes off um so the ability of a character to just go anywhere and do anything is is completely silly in in a wartime game whereas in ac2 and brotherhood and, and revelations like it totally makes sense because these were open trading cities that anybody could go to there wasn't any active wars going on and it's just like yeah sure come in you know buy some stuff while you're here contribute to the local economy so it it ends up giving a a totally different feeling to the player yeah it really feels as though and tim we were just talking about this the other day that they want you to have these like multiple sides they're all all the assassin's creed games are kind of obsessed with like there are red guards and blue guards and you can kill either of them and doesn't really make a difference like they want you to feel like you're between two sides, but because, especially in Odyssey's case, it's never really a focal point of the story what side you're on. It really just feels like they're all the same and that it doesn't matter if someone's Spartan or Athenian. I can go into either city. Yeah. I can do whatever I want. I can fight on either side in any battle based on what kind of loot I'm going to get at the end. So mm-hmm. I think that's that's actually a really good example of where maybe on a storytelling level and on a, a role-playing level, they're missing the opportunity to really get you invested in a particular side 
by virtue of the fact that that it never really matters. So, yeah, it's like despite all of the ability of the player to to go and, and do and, and make all these changes, it ends up just feeling arbitrary and weightless in a way that like when you're Ezio, you're putting in money to, you know, to rebuild the, the villa or to rebuild Rome or Constantinople, even though it's a much more mechanically shallow endeavor, it ends up having a much more like emotionally resonant feeling on the story because you put the money into the villa, you put the money into the city, and then you see and benefit from the way that it like it comes back to life. That's a much more effective way to get that same feeling, but in a way that doesn't end up being, you know, janky and weird with a character whose loyalties, you know, turn on a dime depending on what fancy spear, you know, they might get. So it is interesting that you bring up like Monteregioni versus Rome, because to me personally, I always prefer having just Monteregioni because, and, and I never really thought about it from like an historical standpoint, but I, I guess it kind of does apply that way too for me, because allowing me to like, literally be like the sole capital in Rome kind of <laughs> takes me out of the experience. Yeah. And I do like having Monteregioni because it does, it kind of just feels like this own, even though it's a real place, it, it, it kind of just feels like its own place that doesn't really exist in the rest of the world. And I can go there and upgrade it and it's Ezio's and, and it's the auditory place. But when you start getting into like renovating entire cities, obviously I have other problems with that system, but I, I never thought about it from a historical standpoint of does it really make sense that Ezio is renovating the entire city of Rome? I mean, you're right. It, when when you expand the scope, you lose the focus and then you lose the impact. Yeah. So from, you yeah. know, from a historical perspective, that's another way that that going, you know, too much and too big ends up dampening the effect. And I think that's just a general problem that you see in the more recent games is that they they are too big that your ability to interact with the world and feel a sense of place is so diminished, even if the worlds are lovingly rendered in a way that is like, yeah, this is like probably the best recreation of ancient Greece that we're going to get in a very long time and that, you know, the historical community has <laughs> ever seen. Like, even with that, the emotional connection that you as a player can feel is, is so smooshed by just the sheer scale that you're forced to contend with. Yeah, I think that also on a character level, right, when they decided to kind of take this direction of let's kind of do some Witcher 3 style things, they also took mm -hmm. what made Witcher 3 possible as far as the story goes for Geralt in the sense that, you know, he's a, a Witcher. His job is to help random people with things that they need help with. That means you can go across the entire world and be doing fetch quests for people and, and completing tasks and killing monsters. And it's all right with the character. That's not what an assassin yeah, that's does. That's a great point. So in these historical yep. settings, they're like, okay, well, you're playing as a Medjai or you're playing as a Mystheos, which are essentially historical Geralts. And they just go around and they help people. Yeah. But without being grounded in the, you know, the fantasy world and the lore that, that say a franchise like The Witcher provides for you, it really does feel like a flimsy justification to create a game where you can go around and just do busy work for people all the time yeah, and grounding it in, point. you know, in the world of what an assassin's obligations are, or even as, as Edward as a pirate, right? Like the fact mm -hmm. that you're caught between the assassins and Templars and that really interesting story way that they set that up. It's more in your literal job description to be doing the things you're doing in yeah. those games. And now in order to accommodate a big fuck off world with hundreds of side quests, we've <laughs> lost the part of the character story, the the fantasy even yeah. of Assassin's Creed. And that's, yeah. I mean, maybe that's not a historical accuracy thing, but I get that also if they're going to go to a time before Assassins even existed, we're going to play as a Mystheos, whatever the fuck that is, <laughs> because that's what existed. Yeah apparently you know and for sure mystheos is just a greek word for wage earner implying that they fought for money instead of fighting for their city or fighting for you know like civic glory or right it's like mercenaries so creed. like a thing that existed but you know it, it wasn't it wasn't to the same level in the game as it ended up being like a century later gotcha. and you know there, there are some things where i'm willing to like grant a little bit of, of wiggle room to make you know mechanics in a game fit because ancient greece is a very long period of time it's hard to get you know a a complete picture with just you know a a, a sliver of, of of time but uh there are some things that that they do that that stretch the <laughs> the kind of realism of it where it's like yeah you're living in in classical greece in this game but the way that you act is reminiscent of you know 
the age of heroes and like Homeric stuff huh. from like a thousand years earlier. Or like putting Pythagoras in it at the age of 150. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this is too much of a, of a hard right turn, but I can make a comparison to Ghost of Tsushima. I would love for you to make a comparison of Ghost of Tsushima, but Tim, did you have something to say? I do think that all of what you're saying, like, uniquely kind of fits into the uh, idea of what you were saying before Blue about how earlier games philosophy was your blade in the crowd. And I think, and that very much motivated like a lot of your decision making, it's especially in the first game where you, you kind of kill a target and it doesn't matter what side of the war he's on, what he represents, you know, he's a Templar and, and, and that is why you were killing him. And I think that focus does kind of fade away as the games go on and it always makes me think about what Belek was saying about how like we've concerned ourselves too much with like revolutions and wars, you know, like we're losing focus mm -hmm. of what we're supposed to be doing as assassins and that's killing Templars. We're not supposed to be, you know, like the uh, the the head of a revolution or, or what have you and and so uh lost in like what you were saying about how like you're just kind of like a mercenary it's like you're not really taking up the assassin cause you're just kind of or any cause right right yeah for sure and they think that it's giving you the choice of like you know presumably could a character or could a player just go through assassin's creed odyssey and like i'm i'm a spartan the whole time and just never fight for the athenians i suppose no, no, because the game makes you fight for the Athenians at certain points in the story. That 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 is true. You couldn't even if you tried. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's like there's no way to immerse yourself if you're constantly making those choices for extrinsic reasons and not for intrinsic reasons. Like you have to be. Yeah. Like, you know, I would look at a conquest battle and they'd say this one's medium. This this side is hard and this side will get you more loot. And I'll go, OK, I like a challenge, so I will just choose the harder battle. And then I'm fighting in yeah. a battle that I have no investment in whatsoever as to the outcome other than that I win. Whereas you can yep. look at Rogue and you can be involved in a naval clash. And whenever you're in a naval clash, you are on the side uh, of the British. You are fighting the French and you've got all of your British homie ships. They have health bars in the corner of the screen and they're going down. And you are going to care at least a little bit that like the people whose team you're on don't die. And yeah. that's a level of like motivation in that context that you just can't have in a game where you're playing all sides. And I think that Valhalla is going to be really interesting because on one hand, you are a Viking. Presumably you have the uh, alliance of you're going to be helping your tribe first and foremost. But as we've mm -hmm. already seen in gameplay, you're going to be fighting other Viking tribes, which means you're going to be helping Saxons and you're yeah. going to be helping the British in that in that's in those situations. Yeah. And it's slippery. It's really slippery to get you to still care. It, it is slippery. To be fair, from a historical perspective, that's not baseless because, oh, no. you know, it wasn't like unified Viking army versus like unified Anglisk and Saxon kingdoms, uh, which uh, I can get into this in a second. But the terminology <laughs> that they use for Valhalla ends up like bordering on problematic. Oh, really? Um, but I want to know more about that. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll finish this and then I'll explain <laughs> that. Uh, like the, the way that they have like, you know, Anglisk and Saxon kingdoms and Vikings, like these weren't unified monolithic sides. Like they were all kind of playing off each other yeah. for whatever advantages they can get. So in that, in that regard, it will actually be somewhat accurate to be like an opportunistic Viking trying to just make ends meet here and like find a space for your people. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean it's going to be the most engaging for gameplay. Exactly. Um, to the, to the point of Valhalla, one of the things is that in the marketing, and again, I, I, I hesitate to throw too many stones when I haven't played the game because things can always change and marketing and gameplay are sometimes not the most aligned but the way that they promoted the story in Valhalla and you know not along if this is stuff that you heard is ah uh, in, in, in Dark Age England you are a Viking coming from your lands to go fight among these broken petty kingdoms and build a home for your people well, okay sure sure <laughs> um, uh, you're, you're gonna go fight all these Anglo-Saxons Anglo-Saxon is not a thing there were a series of migrations after the fall of the Roman Empire where the Angles, the Jutes, and the Saxons, and also kind of the Picts up in Scotland, um, came into Britain and started, you know, living there and, you know, having a good time. So Anglo-Saxon is not a monolithic term. Right. There were Angles and Saxons, but Anglo-Saxon is not a thing. And it's been kind of co-opted in unsavory ways by um, by people on the right who proclaim that, like, ah, oh, yes, our Anglo-Saxon heritage uh -huh. is, you know, faultless and perfect. It's like, it's not... It's not a thing. You're, you're inventing an identity where there was none. It was a lot of different people's, you know... 
intermingling together in this historical cauldron of, of early medieval Britain. And calling it Dark Ages is also problematic um, because the term Dark Age from a historical perspective refers to a time when there are no records. Huh. That's all it implies. It, it doesn't imply um, anything about the smartness of the people in that period. Uh, it doesn't imply anything about, you know, the light or, conditions. Uh, about, um, <laughs> Yeah, about the light conditions in a cloudy dark age. Um, I mean, having seen the weather in Britain, yeah, they are living in the dark ages. <laughs> they still uh, are. But, you know, it, it it doesn't apply anything about the, like, smartness of, of people there. So it isn't the dark ages because there was still writing. People just didn't, you know, you know regress back to illiteracy. Um, there was a rich monastic tradition coming out of Ireland and then up in, into the north of, of England, the south of Scotland, where, you know, it was like the place to preserve Greek and Latin scholarship in in Europe. There was there were there were two poles uh, in Europe in the Christian world where scholarship was being you know preserved. It was Byzantium and the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, and it was you know Ireland. And then outside of that, there was the Muslim world, but that's you know that's peripheral to the Viking stuff. Um, only kind of. <laughs> uh, but uh, the point is, um, calling it the Dark Ages and leading with that as the pitch of what the game is about is just so misleading in a way that almost any historian will tell you is kind of shitty. Wow. Um, and granted, in my videos, I, I've been guilty of using the term dark ages in, in a couple isolated instances, but even then it's mostly in exaggeration rather than to actually legitimately describe the conditions of a place. Um, where it's like, oh, you know, while these guys were bumbling around in the dark ages, Ireland knew what was that. Well, yeah, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm obviously, you know, joking for comparison. But the, the way that they talk about, you know, Anglo-Saxons in the dark ages is just like, off-putting enough that historians are, are getting a little antsy about it. Interesting. Um, and there are other things about the way that they portray Vikings that is just iffy from a historical perspective going in. Like, they don't have the horned helmets. You know, we all know that's just a, that's a myth made from Wagner in 1800s German opera. Horn helmets aren't a thing. But the Vikings in Valhalla are, like, you know, fur and leather fetish, like, decked out to hell with, like, all of these, like, furs and leather bracers and this and that, which they wouldn't really really have had all that much. It would have been, you know, cloth and some chain mail and not a lot super fancy, but of course, because they want to fit the aesthetic that a lot of people have in their minds, they, you know, they take the costumes up to 10 and all of the tattoos that these characters have is, is not historically attributed at all. There are some, you know, Vikings in Eastern Europe that were described as, as having tattoos in like one and a half sources. But, you know, so much of these aesthetic qualities of the Viking Age that Valhalla is really latching onto and borderline sensationalizing are either, you know, iffy from a record standpoint or just kind of fabricated. So from a wow. historical perspective, there is a lot that they can still do right. You know, the, the characters, the, the setting, the world will probably be very good, but the aesthetics of the Vikings is so sensationalized that it makes me wary of what the actual game will end up being. Huh. I, I can still very much be proven wrong, but the reason that, um, and, and one of a friend of the channel, um, Yellow, who uh, does um, historical game streams, has talked about this at, at some length, uh, the many reasons that uh, Valhalla specifically looks problematic in a way that the other AC games really haven't. Um, because even though there are a lot of problems with, you know, the aesthetics of, of, of Odyssey and Origins, um, there's nothing that's quite been on the level of, of what they're doing to the Vikings uh, in Valhalla. So Yeah, I had no idea about any of that stuff. Oh, they also do a lot of kind of crappy stuff about the, the Celtic peoples in Britain that looks to be hella sensationalized beyond like anything that is is legitimate or, or, or borne out by historical documentation or archaeology. So there's some iffy <laughs> stuff in there. That's crazy. Yeah, I never I never knew anything about that stuff, but it makes sense. This isn't a thing where other past AC games are maybe similarly guilty of sensationalizing the aesthetic of something like is this is this something new for the series, you think? I think so. I, th I think it's it is too it's not necessarily new, but it is to a much more significant degree than we've seen before. Okay. 
Um, and I can't speak to everything because ag- right. again, you know, like the the Valhalla stuff from from my understanding of the Viking history. And, and again, the Vikings went to a lot of places. Yeah. So what you hear about the Vikings in Ireland is very different from what you'll hear about the Vikings in Scandinavia versus what you'll hear about the Vikings in like the Black Sea around like modern day Ukraine. It's it's not new because you always have a kind of like sensationalizing and and fantasizing of the history in order to, you know, put butts in seats and sell product. But even the pirates, like they were fancy people. They they dressed up for show. Blackbeard was a performer more than he was ever a fighter. Um, and that kind of stuff is accurate because it's it's true of the characters that they were all just right. big personalities. Um, so that kind of stuff, the fantastical elements, like they fit the historical, you know, tone and and meaning of a period, even if they're not strictly adhering to the surface characteristics. So there's a difference between like surface historical accuracy and really like mechanical, like deep level meaningful realism. And there's an, an extra credits video on this that 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 talks about it really well um, and shows how, you know, just beyond like getting the facts and dates and costumes right, there, there's a lot to be said for the way that a game makes you feel and puts you in the shoes of a character who would be in that historical situation. AC2 is fantastic because being you know, Brotherhood and Revelations, like being this rich Italian, like banker playboy guy, you know, fits very well with, you know, the fantasy of traveling around all these cities and getting to brush shoulders with all these like fancy artist hotshots. Like that is what a character like Ezio would have been doing. So it's totally on par. Um, For a character like Connor in AC3, it's, it's interesting and different because, you know, we don't have a lot of documentation for people of like half, you know, British and half Native American ancestry. So we kind of make him do what Ezio does, and then it feels weird when it's, you know, incongruous. So there are, there are different levels of, of realism in the experience and the mechanics that is, is of a different kind um, completely than the experience of, of the historical, you know, surface qualities and, and surface aesthetics of, of a period. What were you going to say about, um, about Ghost of Tsushima, which is like my favorite game I've played so far this year, but I really don't know much about the historical side of things other than that they did take some liberties and that like, you know, Koten Khan was not a real guy and things like that. Yeah. So Ghost of Tsushima is a really interesting uh, case study in historical accuracy in games because it ends up not being very accurate, Gotcha. but it almost doesn't matter because they're not trying to sell you on a realistic depiction of the actual events of the Mongol invasion of, you know, 1272 or 1274 or whatever. Um, They're trying to sell you on an homage to samurai cinema. And those are very different things. And it ends up showing because you have all of like the showdowns (laughs) and these like very dramatic, like windy, like Kurosawa kinds of battles where all this stuff is happening, which is, is very accurate to the, the, you know, the, fantasy of of samurai movies but it's not trying to be a historically accurate game the you know the character of Koten Khan is is made up but the way in which he acts is not uncharacteristic of a Mongol warlord they weren't just these brutal conquerors they were deeply smart and always made sure to go into a new place knowing about the people they were dealing with so they could prepare a battle plan and know what to do so you know at the beginning where where Koten Khan tells Lord Shimura like look when you were sharpening your blade this morning I was reading I was studying I was preparing my mind yeah. for this like that kind of stuff is really historically accurate and ends up having an impact on the course of the story so that realism is so much more valuable than like oh well actually you know the, technically the katana didn't actually exist for another hundred <laughs> years and the kind of armor that Jin is wearing that really that's like a 14 1500s huh. thing so like all of those details are just you know not at all trying to be accurate but they're trying to be accurate to the the samurai aesthetic and the samurai fantasy from Kurosawa movies where it makes sense and they're trying to be accurate to the historical realism where it makes right. sense. So the funny thing about the Mongol invasion is um, it, it lasted like a couple days. They showed up on the island of Tsushima, but their ships were destroyed by a storm. So they couldn't get any reinforcements and they just kind of packed up and left. They fought a battle 
And that was it. So like this whole thing of, oh, the Mongols have taken over the island and we have to go through all this effort to get rid of them. Like, no, just wait a couple days. They'll be gone. <laughs> they'll they'll pack up and leave. Like they'll leave their one star reviews. Then you don't need to worry about it anymore. <laughs> um, so they can accomplish a lot by picking their battles and, and adhering to various types of, of source material where it suits them. So in a way, it's it's a model for the kind of thing that Assassin's Creed could do. Granted, you know, not every culture has a Kurosawa-like body of, of pop culture work to draw from, but it's a great example of, of doing it really, really right in a way that, you know, not only makes me um, jealous of, of the gameplay of, of, of Ghost of Tsushima, like, oh, this is what the new Assassin's Creeds are trying to be. I see it now. Oh, no, they do it so much better. <laughs> but like in the, from a historical perspective of like bringing in all of these different elements and, and, and fusing them together in a way that is so plausible, but not trying to lie to you and pretend like this is what actually happened. So it does so many things so well that like I'm mad about how good it is. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I think that between Ghost of Tsushima and Assassin's Creed, you have two very different visions of how a, a, a game can handle historical accuracy. But obviously, I think the thing that makes both of them work is that they have an approach and that they're doing things specifically and they're doing things on purpose. Like, yeah. I think I read something about Ghost of Tsushima, like, do they technically get things wrong about what was available and what existed at the time? Yes, of course. But they're all deliberate choices. They're not including haikus because they think that haikus existed, right? Right. Yeah. It's because it's part of the audience's understanding of, like, this culture that's been kind of, like, homogenized through time into one idea of what the samurai are. But the samurai were around for hundreds and hundreds of years and filled very different roles across yeah. that time. Do you feel like, even though, you know, you can look at Odyssey and you can see all the ways that they've done this sort of stunning recreation of of a of a place and the, mm -hmm. there are all of these characters that are fairly faithfully rendered at the same time you know you have like i can come across a cyclops and shoot it in the eye and all of these sort of mythological yeah. <laughs> inclusions that are maybe betraying the idea of historical accuracy as a defining element of of the assassin's creed games mm -hmm. do you think that over time that historical accuracy has become less important to the developers or do you think that its role has just changed? I think that in a environment of game design where you want to create bigger, more complex experiences where the player can go anywhere and do anything, it is a natural consequence that you lose the focus that allows you to craft a very historically grounded character. So there is no basis for a character like Alexios or Cassandra, you know, in, in Greek history, in, in that period of Greek history, at least. The, the thing with like the Cyclopses and the mythical characters is like the way that these creatures exist reflects the way that the Greeks thought about them. So it's like, yeah, underneath the island of Crete, there's a bull monster. <laughs> if you go under there into the labyrinth, you'll find him. So I mean, it's not exactly one to one, yeah. but, you know, the way that the game presents the, the, the monsters of mythology is a pretty good reflection of how the Greeks at this point in time understood their world. It's like, yeah, there, there are all these like fantastical things out there, but you have to go really out of your way to find them because they're not going to be, you know, Cyclopses running around in downtown Athens like in, you know, in Disney's Hercules or anything like that. So that I actually kind of give them a pass on because even though it's like, yes, obviously there are no, you know, Cyclopses. If you ask someone in ancient Greece, they would have told you, yeah, there were. So that's actually where I will, I'll go like fully out on, you know, you know, my, my <laughs> principles and say like, look, I, I stand by that. Like that is, that is actually meaningful historical accuracy because even though it's obviously wrong, it is true to what it would have been like to be a character in that point in time. Interesting. The The problem with, with historical accuracy as we go on is that as the player gets more agency to terraform the landscape of the world, um, it becomes so much harder to craft a focused experience for them to, to be a character, you know, when the player is getting lost in go everywhere, do everything, you are all powerful, no one can touch you, and, you know, there's, there's no consequences for anything. The ways in which the games have gotten less bound to historical realism are much more nuanced than, oh, there's myths in it now, because there are a lot of things that are better and worse to some degrees about how they're 
how they're progressing and whether, you know, the good outweighs the bad is, is ultimately up to you. Valhalla notwithstanding, because we really have to see how badly they messed that one up <laughs> or if it turns out to be great. So I'm hopeful, but not optimistic, <laughs> if that makes sense. So I think that's a great point. I think you're you're spot on. And that's honestly, that's a great way of looking at some of the mythology I- inclusion in, in these past couple of games that I hadn't really thought about. Um, yeah, me, so I, I really me appreciate either. that. Something I wanted to mention was um, I feel like Assassin's Creed more than most games run a risk of becoming just these like historical theme parks. And I think a lot of people play Assassin's Creed for that reason. They like running around Renaissance Italy. Yeah. I mean, like who doesn't, you know, I, I do. And so I do, I do think that people who, for instance, like want the modern day to be dropped or that they want the Assassin Templar conflict to be, you know, watered down more. Like, I think the people who want those things and just want to have this historical theme park to run around in. What I, what I, what I don't think that they acknowledge, though, is I think the reason why it's so fully realized, especially in a game like AC2, and the reason why it's so compelling to be a part of that world is because, as you were saying, Blue, is that, you know, you're, you're a character that's grounded in this reality and you're a character that exists in this history. Yeah. And so that's why you can go talk to Leonardo da Vinci. And it's and it's, you know, it's like you're building that friendship connection, like you said earlier, instead of just, oh, let me walk around as a faceless, you know, character being able to, you know, go to the Colosseum in Rome is compelling because like there's a purpose to it and th- there's a method to the yeah madness and i think if it was just okay so here's rome and you could get to create your character and and you know and and it's like a like a skyrim yeah. type deal wouldn't wouldn't it be as compelling to me i think personally no, I totally agree, because to your point, like the more that you build a theme park out of the game world and turn it into a historical fantasy rather than a historical like narrative experience is that the more of a theme park the game becomes, the less room the writers are given to write a very good story. And I think that we've seen that in the narratives of, of Odyssey and Origins, which are passable at best, but really not that great. When you look at just the, the pure narrative level where the story used to be the selling right. point of the AC games. The irony is that in their efforts to make the game more dynamic, as you said, more systemic, more reactive to the influences that are put on it by the player, what we've actually gotten on pretty much all levels in terms of story and in terms of engagement and role playing, it actually becomes a remarkably static world. It actually becomes not very yeah. dynamic. You know, the fact that I can participate in all these battles yeah. and decide the outcome of, of who wins, all that's changing is like a progress bar in the map screen. It's not changing the world in a meaningful way. Mm-hmm. All of these missions that I go on to assassinate a target, it's always the same fort structure that I'm doing, the same stealth moves and the same air assassinations. And while there's technically loads of freedom in how I approach that mission, it means that all of those missions that I'm going to play through the duration of an 80 to 100 hour playthrough are all going to end up feeling largely the same. Yeah, in in service of of making a game that's so malleable and bendable to the player's will, they've made a game that's paper thin. Yeah. And kind of flat and, you know, ultimately less interesting. So you're you're totally right. I don't know if people with these games will be able to have the same kind of experience that I did with AC, um, with AC2 and Brotherhood and Revelations, where I feel like I am a part of this world and I am friends with Machiavelli, (laughs) goddammit. You know, I, I feel like people aren't able to have those kinds of experiences that have been so formational to me in my interest in history that I, I really can't help but feel like something's been lost. So, you know, as, as much as we can praise how great of a job the world's team is doing, it's it's not just a matter of like, oh, you know, you know, the Vikings aren't dressed properly. You know, the outfits they're wearing are kind of silly. It's there's something more deep that is being given up uh, in these more recent games that I feel like I've been trying to articulate this for months now and years, and I've finally been able to figure <laughs> it out. So I'm glad I was able to, to be able to talk about that. That's exactly how I've been feeling, too, in the sense that, you know, Sure, I was reading for school and I remembered that Pericles died. But, you know, when I remember Blackbeard's death, I also remember being sad about it. When I remember Pericles' death, yeah. I remember that Pericles died. I don't remember, like, any emotional experience yeah. that I had associated right. with that or with the plague in general or really anything to do with the historical elements yeah. of that story. So, yeah. luckily, guys, in this episode, we cracked the case to why Assassin's Creed sucks now. And uh, <laughs> we figured it out. 
Sucks specifically like S U X. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, I think that's probably a good place to start wrapping things up. Thank you so much, Blue, for joining us. It's been great to have you on. And I know I've learned a ton of things that I did not know. Thank you for having me on. This was a wonderful experience. Uh, Lawson, Tim, I, I have to uh, express my, my <laughs> deepest gratitude for uh, being able to come on and, and talk Absolutely. shop about uh, AC with you guys. I feel like I've uh, I've been able to like draw a line between like me back then and me now. It's like, oh, I know things that I can tell people that look smart. Cool. We've changed and grown up so much. Uh, I'll remind you guys again, listening to check out his, Blue's Realism Reviews if you haven't already and subscribe to Overly Sarcastic Productions if you haven't already because uh, it's easily one of the best channels on YouTube. Oh, you flatter me. Obviously, guys, if you like this episode, we would really appreciate if you subscribe to our channel. Uh, leave us a comment. Talk about maybe something that you experienced about history in regards to Assassin's Creed. Like, what are some of those those connections that you've made to your your real life and your education uh, based on things you learn in the games? Because we'd love to hear those stories. Obviously, if you enjoy the show, if you have friends who like Assassin's Creed or like history or or like three people talking on a podcast about those things, you know, send them a link, spread the word, <laughs> spread the love. Follow us on Twitter at Hookblade. Uh, you can follow uh, Blue on Twitter at... OSP YouTube. There you go, OSP YouTube. <laughs> I've been the hook. I've been the blade. And I've been that, like, dumbass <laughs> pivot hidden blade thing that Connor has where I stab myself in the wrist a million times. And we will see you next week to talk about Assassin's Creed 3, which is going to be a really long episode because Tim and I both hate it a lot. <laughs> and the blade, so you can use one or the other.